Hello everyone. Today we will be talking about Dr. Jordan B. Peterson, a man who is properly internet famous for telling you to bloody well clean your room, eh? Or to stand up with your shoulders back and pet cats when you see one in the street. I don't care about your fucking allergies, Eric. Just pet a fucking cat. One of the things I've always thought about Hitler is that, you know, people... You have to admire Hitler. That's the thing. Okay, yeah, there are other things, but I think it's best if I introduce you slowly to these ideas so you aren't alarmed and immediately think he's some sort of half-man, half-lobster, Nazi-admiring, petulant child pensioner. Before we get into it, let's speedrun Jordan's history a little bit. Lorden began to exist, then aged, then got a degree in political science and psychology from the University of Alberta. He then went on to get a doctorate in clinical psychology from McGill University in Montreal. He has had a genuinely very impressive career as a psychologist, becoming a professor at Harvard University and operating his own clinical practice too. He's co-authored over a hundred academic papers, so he surely has a big brain that is definitely big and brilliant. While it's clear that I'm about to go on a rant for a whole amount of time about how it's possible to be good brain at some things and bad brain about other things, I believe that Jordan Peterson is a great clinical psychologist. I've read his 12 Rules for Life and think that it can be a great starting point for young, disenfranchised men who want to measurably improve their lives without resorting to Andrew Tate. But honestly, that's where it ends. His obsession with the human mind, metaphorical substrates and lobsters being our spirit animals or whatever bleed into every conversation he has, regardless of its relevance. The guy couldn't write a cookie recipe without cramming in some Machiavellian metatruths about Raskolnikov or some other ham-brained bollocks. I've broken down his main talking points into different subheaders to help us keep on track. I'll do my best to cover what I can without going into granular detail because we've all got shit to do, but I'll include some extra credit in the description below if you want to expand on this once you're done watching. Jordan E. Cletuson shot to fame by refusing to comply with Canada's amendments to the Canadian Human Rights Act and the Criminal Code, referred to as Bill C-16. JBP stood solo against the tide of blue-haired femboys and uber-liberal cucks that sought to jail free-thinking Canadians if they ever so much as accidentally called the wrong bloke a Sheila. Well, that's what Dorkton Tweedison would have you think. In reality, Bill C-16 is simply a piece of legislation that added gender identity or expression as being a protected characteristic. That means you cannot be discriminated against because you don't identify with the gender you were assigned at birth. See, this whole human rights thing has been around for a while, protecting you from being discriminated against because of your race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, whether you're disabled, or if you look like a ventriloquist doll being possessed by the spirit of Kermit the Frog, you know, for example. There really is no more context to this. That's just objectively what the bill does. To this day, nobody has been jailed as a result of the amendment because, obviously, read a fucking book, you absolute virgin. Boom, roasted. But let's take a look at how Yeezy P. Leiterson decided to characterize this bill. Now, he's a smart guy. He's read Nietzsche, after all. I'm sure he gets it. One of the reasons that I opposed Bill C-16 in Canada to begin with, this pronoun compelled speech bill, was because I knew perfectly well what was going to happen when we introduced confusion about gender identity into the public sphere. Okay, maybe he didn't read the bill. Now, I could go through the response by the Canadian Bar Association that explicitly debunks whatever the fuck this guy is talking about, or the response from Toronto law professor Brenda Cosman, but I think that the fact that the bill has been active for seven years now, and literally nobody gives a single fuck about it, is the best proof that he was just being an outrageously disingenuous man-child. After all, why pay attention to what legal professionals think about the scope and application of a law when you can speak to a man who has to genuinely pause to consider whether or not he is 
a literal prophet of God. You know, and just going back onto this issue of, of you sort of almost being a prophet in a way, do you view yourself as that? I mean, as religion declines, you go on this world tour, millions of people read your books, billions of people probably watching the videos online. Uh, do you see yourself as a sort of new religious phenomenon for people? Not new. Not new. And I see myself as fortunate. That's how I see myself, that I have the opportunity to do this. But are you a prophet? And, uh, see, to say yes or no, I have to think about how, I think I have to think about how, how I might be conceptualized, how what I'm doing might be conceptualized. No, I think I see myself as a psychologist. That's led us nicely onto his religious thoughts. And so here's a bold statement to kick this one off. Jordan Peterson is an atheist. See, despite his best-selling self-help book stating that you should be precise in your speech, man, whenever he is asked whether he believes in God, his words turn into a big old stupid biological substrate of transcendent Jungian metatruths, or something. Let's take a look at this conversation between atheist Sam Harris and whatever Justin P. Bieberson is, where he tries to explain, as precisely as possible, remember, what he means by God. God is how we imaginatively and collectively represent the existence and action of consciousness across time, as the most real aspects of existence manifest themselves across the longest of time frames, but are not necessarily apprehensible as objects in the here and now. God is that which eternally dies and is reborn in the pursuit of higher being and truth. That's a fundamental element of hero mythology. God is the highest value in the hierarchy of values. That's another way of looking at it. God is what calls and what responds in the eternal call to adventure. God is the voice of conscience. God is the source of judgment and mercy and guilt. God is the future to which we make sacrifices and something akin to the transcendental repository of reputation. Well, I'm sure we can all agree that those were indeed words that exist. Now let's pull ourselves back to the English language for a second. I'm not sure if this needs to be explicitly stated, but people who believe in God are making a positive statement that they literally believe that there is a conscious or unconscious mover that created the universe. If you're asked whether or not you believe in God, the answer should not involve hierarchical value structures or meta-truths about postmodernist lobsters or any other stupid bollocks. The question that's being asked is, do you believe there is an unmoved mover that created everything? And the answer is simply yes or no. There's no room for ambiguity or I don't know, because it's not a question of knowledge, it's a question of beliefs. Jorman de Pletusen humiliated a very famously atheistic Matt Dillahunty in a live debate by telling him that he believes in God, because he doesn't want to murder people like Raskolnikov does in Crime and Punishment. You know, the fictional book about totally fictional characters that Jordan likes to refer to as if it were an absolute universal truth. Anyway, here's the clip. So, I'm telling you I don't believe there's a god, and yeah. your, your response to that is, I really do, because I have a moral sense, but my moral sense is utterly without any appeal to a god. Explicitly. Or implicitly. Uh, maybe. The f That's not so obvious. Okay, it's really See, because it's, it's you, easy. Regard, you regard Sam Harris as an implicitly valuable entity, because otherwise you'd just throw him off the stage. And then the question is, well, just exactly why is he an implicitly valuable entity? Need a stronger argument for God? Take a fat bite out of this. Language Stops people from smoking. Well, you can stop smoking without any sort of supernatural intervention. No, not really. You can't stop smoking without supernatural? There aren't really any any reliable chemical means for inducing smoking cessation. What? Not convinced? He's another sort of argument, I guess. 
Are there no godless artists and poets? Well, there are artists and poets who think they're godless. So I think it's fair to say that borden Feterson really isn't providing any value to religious argumentation. He consistently avoids the question of belief in God by being so obtuse that I genuinely thought this next clip was a parody of himself. You know, so people say to me, what do you, do you believe in God? And I think, okay, there's a couple of mysteries in that question. What do you mean do? What do you mean you? What do you mean believe? And what do you mean God? The man actually asked, what do you mean by do? When he talks on the topic of divinity and God, he isn't literally talking about a god. He's talking about what individual people might consider to be the peak of their value hierarchy. In Morden T. Beeferson's worldview, God is like a cheap hooker because he can be anything you want him to be. It's a good example of how his obsession with hierarchies, archetypes, and Friedrich Nietzsche's big juicy willy finds its way into every subject he weighs in on. This one really frustrates me. To understand why, you need to understand the fact that climate change is a well-understood and well-researched field. And both the fact that the climate is changing, along with the fact that humans are adversely impacting the climate, sees an overwhelming consensus in the scientific community. For reference, the number of scientists that accept climate change as a reality is comparable to the amount that believe in evolution. This topic has led me to the conclusion that Jordan is the kind of smart person that, in understanding a great deal about one field of study, he must therefore be intelligent enough to give a good take on every other issue. To illustrate the level of conversation he's having about the environment, let's take a look at his appearance on the Joe Rogan experience. That well, one, that's because um, there's no such thing as climate, right? Climate and everything are the same word. And I, that's what bothers me about the climate change types. It's like, this is something that bothers me about it technically. It's like, well, climate is about everything. So, okay, but your models aren't based on everything. I don't know if he's purposefully straw manning just for banter, but his pontificating is so obviously just a result of his disdain for the left than it is a genuine interest in arriving at a truthful claim. Aside from the sheer arrogance with which he presents his arguments, and in a fucking tuxedo no less, the obvious problem here is that Blorden Titerson is confusing weather with climate. He hinges his critique on the fact that he simply disagrees that climate models are a useful tool on the basis that we can't exactly predict each variable. It sort of sounds reasonable until you think with your brain for like three seconds. As Professor Steve Sherwood points out, Peterson's argument is like saying we can't predict whether a pot of water on a flame will boil because we can't predict each bubble. Justin Potterton also said, with a straight face, that if you care about the environment, you should just commit suicide, because that's the fastest way to reduce your carbon footprint. Let's run this one through the old brain lobes for a second. People care about the environment. They want to mitigate the damage being done, so they kill themselves. Then nobody is around who cares about the environment, and the environment gets destroyed. What a national treasure. Gordon Wiedersen really is playing 4D wizard's chess over here. Now let's take a little peek at his conversation with Lex Friedman about climate change and hope that it doesn't devolve into something silly like talking about dragons and stuff. Imagine that there's an emergency. Dragon. There's a dragon. Someone comes and says, there's a dragon. I'm the guy to deal with it. That's what the environmentalists say. The radical types who push limits to growth. Okay, why should I listen to you? Well, let's see how you're reacting to the dragon. First of all, you're scared stiff and in a state of panic. That might indicate you're not the man for the job. Second, you're willing to use compulsion to harness other people to fight the dragon for you. So now not only are you terrified, 
You're a terrified tyrant. This clip underlines the problem as I see it. Jordan is spending a significant amount of his time complaining not about climate scientists, but about climate activists. He complains about the hysteria of woke bloody lefties and proclaims that they aren't the great leader that was promised. Brilliant. Thanks, Geordi, but nobody is claiming they should have the authority. You're claiming that. The climate activists aren't, at least for the most part, just shouting about climate change. They are shouting about climate change while holding studies by climate scientists, and the words that they are shouting are, please listen to climate scientists and help us not murder the earth to death. Again, the lack of self-awareness here is astounding. Dorman rose to fame and made millions upon millions of dollars by screaming about how Canada's Bill C-16 was going to end freedom of speech as we know it. I wish there was a word to describe it, like alarmism or something, that'd be cool. Anyway, he's gone from screeching about Bill C-16 because it's the end of the world as we know it, to villainizing climate activists because they're screeching about how it's the end of the world as we know it. The only difference is that one is backed by 60 years of scientific research, and the other is just some mental old man crying because he has to show basic respect towards other people. The fact that Jordan can carve out some time in his schedule to speak to people like Dr. Richard Lindzen, who's probably the most well-credentialed climate change skeptic, but can't find the time to speak publicly with anyone that doesn't agree with his foregone conclusion, is very telling. Surely he's refined his arguments about the environment since January 2022, though. No, not really. He spends most of his time just tweeting angrily at tyrannical paper towel dispensers. Now, you already know that Dr. Jordan has dropped some hot takes about transgenderism, because why the fuck not? He's been pretty correct about everything so far. Don't forget, he's a doctor of clinical psychology and has worked with thousands of clients in a private clinical environment. So yes, he's not only qualified, but justified in saying this about Elliot Page and his transition. When he was promptly banned from Twitter for violating their terms and conditions by deadnaming him, he posted this to his YouTube channel. Hello everyone. A few days ago I penned an irritated tweet. Could you stop saying penned? You wrote a tweet, mate. It's, it's so pretentious. It's so fucking pretentious. In response to the decision of an actress, actor named Ellen Elliot Page, I am employing this awkward and impossible naming style because it is now apparently mandatory. Now, if you're wondering what this weird old man is talking about, he's talking about the impossible naming style of using someone's name. I'm probably doing it wrong nonetheless, as you're doing it wrong is the whole point of what has been made mandatory. But also, I'm trying to make a point. No, for real? This man is dripping with narcissism. The whole video plays as if he's auditioning to be the next Bond villain or something. Anyway, if you look past the self-aggrandizement and take this for what it is, what it is, is a 60-year-old man who is upset that he wasn't allowed to openly bully a transgender person because he thinks that, like, Fascists are gonna steal his lobsters or something. Honestly, fuck knows, I don't know. It's kind of the point. In this video, he states clearly for the record that he would rather die than remove this tweet. Something that would make me very sad and I would be upset about it and everything. Luckily, Big Daddy Musk bought the platform and allowed Peterson to take back his account in November of 22. Jolly good stuff. Dr. Jordan Free Speecherson then immediately called for people who aren't verified to be blocked from engaging those who are verified. I'll try and ignore the fact that he used the word Machiavellian because he's a total arsewipe, but that's an interesting take from somebody hell-bent on being anti-censorship. You know, you can only engage in civil discourse if you're famous enough to be graced with a blue tick or you have to pay $8 a month. I'm sure we shouldn't read too much into the fact that Ford and Peterson is willing to break down in tears when somebody says a bad word about the incel community, while 
also devoting so much of his free time to attacking people because they want to be queer. Not content with just villainizing trans people, Dr. Morden Quiverson then decided to give his fresh, hot, steaming take on women. Let's take a look at some of his stellar work. In May of 2022, he tweeted that this Sports Illustrated model wasn't beautiful. I, I don't think anybody, like, asked him or anything, but still. He described the act of a private company hiring a working model to do a photo shoot and feature on their magazine, which you can choose to purchase or not purchase, as an act of authoritarian tolerance. But Dr. Smart Person, aren't beauty standards inherently subjective? Of course not, you filthy feminist pricks. See, as Dr. Peterson points out in a follow-up tweet, some babies like symmetrical faces. So then, you know, like, that proves his point. Actually, looking at it now, this feels like Jordan just got triggered into bullying a woman because he didn't want to masturbate to her. Way to paint yourself as the good guy in all of this. After trying to defend himself and failing miserably, he asked his team to lock him out of his own Twitter account so he couldn't be tempted by it. Wow, very definitely not Smeagol of you. It's great to see that you're not hopelessly addicted to tweeting or anything. In his Vice interview five years back, Dorben G. Heaterson pondered whether or not men and women could possibly work together without sexual harassment, because, quote, we don't know what the rules are. When pushed to explain what the fuck he's going on about, he used this example. I don't know why, why do you make your lips red? Because they turn red during sexual arousal, that's why. Why do you put rouge on your cheeks? Same reason. By gosh, he's right. The bloody women are making their lips go red, and it's giving me a boner. Am I allowed to slap her ass? What's the etiquette on sniffing her hair? How can we ever overcome such obstacles? It feels very telling to me that he jumps to this as an example of why it's challenging for men and women to work together. It all feels to me like the what was she wearing at the time argument. I mean, why stop at demonizing women? What about men? Should they be allowed to shave? How about getting a haircut? Should women be allowed to wear lipstick that isn't red? Can gay men work with other men? If we merged the lesbian workforce with the lumberjack workforce, how could we tell the difference? Should I stop wearing my assless chaps if I haven't bleached my asshole? God, it's all so complicated. But don't worry, he's not saying that men and women can't work together, you see. He's simply asking questions. He's not saying lipstick's bad, he's just saying that women wear lipstick because it makes you want to fuck them. But he's not saying they can't work with you, they just they just wear rouge because it simulates them having hot and steamy sexy sex with you, not that you would, obviously. So, in summary, men and women could work together, but it also could be bad because of women wearing makeup and skirts and stuff. God, why are you misrepresenting me? That's not what I said. In another interview, he claimed that, quote, The idea that women were oppressed throughout history is an appalling theory. I mean, I don't even know what to say to this one. Oh wait, yes I do. Until the 19th century, married women weren't even considered separate legal entities from their husbands. Women also weren't accepted into universities as a matter of course until the 19th century. They also famously weren't allowed to vote until 1918, and even then that wasn't extended to all women, which came 10 years later. It also wasn't until 1974 that women could finally open a bank account and commit to a mortgage without the co-signing of a man. Now, this isn't an exhaustive list by any means, but it does a decent job of showing you how far this man has managed to jam his head up his own ass. In several of his talks and lectures, Geordi has asserted that he believes that ancient civilizations were informed about the nature of DNA because they have pictures of things that were intertwined. The logic here is that, well, a bunch of people over tens of thousands of years drew pictures of snakes fucking. So, it's kind of like DNA, you know? Like... Her DNA spins around, kinda. 
and the caduceus has snakes wrapping around a rod, so yeah. You can also see it in the rod of Asclepius, except, you know, there's only one snake, so really, not really like it, but okay, it doesn't sound as impressive coming from me, but Dr. Peterson really sells it. Okay, if you're going to force me to say it outright, then I'll admit the obvious fact that DNA looks nothing like two snakes fucking, and the only time the two have ever been compared outside of Dr. Jorpen's lectures is when anthropologists wrote about the similarities while being as high as Snoop Doggy Dog wearing a pair of stilettos, smoking the devil's lettuce on top of the Burj Khalifa. The fact that he genuinely talked about this with some reverence and expected it to be respected is as ridiculous as when he retweeted this man-milking sex dungeon because he was told by a random person on Twitter that it was a Chinese facility, set up to forcefully extract the sperm from men to stop them reproducing. And he just, he just read that. He read that and thought, yep, that's enough research for me. Because he's not a serious sciencey man, not anymore at least. He's just a silly, old grifter. Despite the fact that he tries so hard to present himself as the cool and calm intellectual type, he is deeply angry. The man is seething beneath the surface. He attacks people with such, such vitriol, spending his entire waking existence on Twitter bashing overweight people or trans people just because his dick doesn't twitch when he looks at them. I know this video could have easily stretched to a couple of hours, but honestly I don't think I can listen to another hour of self-aggrandized intellectual masturbation from this Twitter-addicted old cock. See, he's already decided on his worldview. He's decided that you're evil scum for wanting to use a pronoun. You're a despicable, worthless worm because you find thick women hot. Nothing you can say will change his mind because in his mind, he's the new conservative messiah. Thank you for watching, and thank you to my patrons Marie, Jeffrey Anderson, Matt Palmer, Alex Davies, and Nicholas Ellis Brown. You guys are amazing. If you like this video, please like it, subscribe to it, hold it, feel its sumptuous curves against your body. Oh my god, it's wearing red lipstick. Help, help me.